thought it'd be easiest to talk about the regulation of enzymes in a separate video. Same topic as before, so I left this diagram up. Remember, enzymes continually get reused. These are powerful tools in the body, and they're important. But we need to regulate them because, you know, like I drew the analogy before, these tools, you don't just want to keep going. Shh. You don't just leave them on, right? You can't just leave this enzyme on all the time. You don't just leave this going all the time and then just kind of poke it around into to different screws. That's not how tools work. So just like this, we need to be able to turn these enzymes on and off. There's a few ways that we could regulate enzymes. And the first one, probably the most obvious, just don't make it at all. And this is part of the differentiation of our cells. Why is a liver cell different than a heart cell? Well, probably because it makes different enzymes, it expresses different genes. So we don't make enzymes that we're not going to use. So that's important. That's part of how we control where certain chemical reactions are going to occur in the body. We can also destroy it. So once we're done with it, just break it down. That happens in the stomach. We use those enzymes to digest proteins. They get flushed out into the small intestine and then they're deactivated because they don't work in the pH of the intestines and the enzymes in the intestines actually destroy and digest them. So we could just break it down. A little more elegant solution though is just to change the enzyme itself, specifically the active site. Remember this part that fit the substrate? There's a couple ways we could do that. Uh, a lot of drugs target in particular enzymes just by blocking them. Another chemical that's close enough that will block this enzyme and stop it from working. Um, and that's one way of changing the active site. Another way, a little more common in the body, is to alter the active site by adding a chemical to the enzyme itself. So a common one is a phosphate group which has negative charges on it. And as you can imagine, adding a chemical to a protein is going to change its shape a little bit and that might alter this active site enough that that enzyme stops working. Now different enzymes operate differently in this regard. Some are activated by adding a phosphate and others are turned off by adding a phosphate. But either way, this gives us the ability to basically say enzyme go and enzyme stop really handy for a powerful little tool that you want to be able to control. And the last topic with enzymes I want to bring up is cascade reactions. They're called cascade reactions because of the way they resemble a waterfall. I don't know if that's a great illustration of a waterfall, but you've got these rocks and the water falls down and cascades from one rock to the next rock to the next rock. So in that sense, enzymes working together are kind of like that. Very often enzymes work as teams rather than solo. Just like you couldn't cook an entire dinner with one tool, especially not a garlic press. I don't know why I grabbed the garlic press. You need lots of different tools to complete the task. Same is true of enzymes. And so sometimes one enzyme will pass off its product to the next one, which becomes the substrate for that next enzyme, and they keep passing it along. Be kind of like a team approach to folding a paper airplane. Enzyme number one does one fold. Enzyme number two does the next fold. Enzyme number three does the You have a paper airplane, but it took quite a few enzymes and folds to do that. Here's another example. Very often cellular respiration is pictured with this chemical equation. I have a lot of problems with that one, but we'll leave that alone for now. Overall, it's accurate. You start with glucose and oxygen, and after chemical reactions happen, you end up with carbon dioxide and water. Well, one of the big problems I have with this is this arrow right here. This arrow kind of indicates this is one reaction. It is, but that's burning glucose. If you oxidize glucose, if you had a spoonful of glucose and you lit it on fire, it would produce carbon dioxide and water, lots of heat and sparks, and probably some smoke too. Okay, so sorry about that. Let me calm down. 
This is not one chemical reaction. It's over 20 chemical reactions, each facilitated by its own enzyme. So really, this chemical reaction is 20 plus chemical reactions, and that's basically an enzyme cascade. The first enzyme takes a crack at glucose and just tweaks it a little bit. The next one tweaks it a little more. The next one tweaks it a little more. Until finally, in the end, you have this stuff. It's not just one reaction. Let's take a look at a combination of both a cascade reaction and enzyme regulation in one more slide. Here's an example of an enzyme cascade reaction and also enzyme regulation, but let's take the cascade reaction first. So overall, we have an amino acid, threonine, that we want to convert to another amino acid, isoleucine. Reason we might do this, our body needs all 20 amino acids to make a protein. And if we don't have all 20, if we're lacking isoleucine, we can convert it from threonine. But we can't do this in one step. So enzyme number one takes a crack at it, changes threonine a little bit, but then passes off that product to enzyme two, which passes its product to three, four, and five. And finally, enzyme five finishes the work and produces isoleucine. So there's our cascade reaction. Each enzyme does its job to modify the previous molecule just a little bit and do a complex series of chemical reactions. Well, what about the regulation? Well, that's a good question. Why would we want to do that? Let's say we had 100 threonine molecules and zero isoleucine. And when we finished all this, we had zero threonine and 100 isoleucine. Well, unfortunately, that means we still have 19 amino acids and we need 20. So that was a bad idea. We need to regulate the enzymes. So let's try again. We have 100 threonine. We convert 10 of them. Now we have 90. We have 10 isoleucine. We're getting a little bit closer. We kind of like 50-50, but we're getting close. Let's say enzyme number one here, there were 10 of those around. So isoleucine actually acts as the inhibitor. It binds to enzyme number one here on what's known as the allosteric site, just something that's not the active site. Changes the active site so it turns it off. And so now we only have nine of those enzymes in activity. There are only nine of them doing something. Now I know we said we had 10 of these, but it's still pretty sparse in the cell, so not all 10 of them are going to go up and turn off all 10 of those enzymes. But by the time we get to this sort of 50 threonine and 50 isoleucine, we should have shut off most of those enzymes so that the chemical chain reaction stops and we have a balance of each. A pretty elegant system for making sure that we maintain all 20 amino acids. There you go, that's the rest of enzymes. The idea that enzymes need to be regulated and they work as teams in these cascade reactions. It's important that we regulate these very powerful and important tools inside of cells. I'd be curious, next time you go to the Cascade Mountains or see a waterfall that reminds you of enzymes, I know I've really done my job, maybe a little too well. Let me know about it in the comments if you think about that. Until next time, remember, life is good.